Good morning. Welcome to this session about pioneers in, and the evolution of minimally invasive surgery and, and endoscopic surgery. Uh, I'm Steve Eubanks. My co-moderator is Sharon Bachman, and it's a great pleasure to host this session. I think it's a very interesting, exciting session, and I, I was honored to be a part of this, not just because of our, our speakers and their expertise, but also because of where we actually are today. For those of you who attended the foundation lunch and you saw we honored those people who are innovators and who have spent the last 20 or 25 years contributing to this field. I was a resident in the late 80s and early 90s, and I recall a time during residency where I wondered if surgery was the right field. And the reason was I was a first and second year resident and not only was I being taught about how to do a hernia repair the way that Dr. Halstead and Dr. Bassini had done it 100 years earlier, I was being told that's the way we do hernia repairs, that there were these crazy people doing Lichtenstein repairs or some crazy Canadian shoulder ice repair, but the way we should do it is the way that it had been done for 100 years. And I thought I'm in a field of medicine that has not changed or evolved significantly in a hundred years. This is what we do. And the lack of creativity was driving me crazy. And then, in about my third year, we had Eddie Joe Reddick come and talk to us about laparoscopic cholecystectomy as the last five minutes of his talk about lasers of doing breast surgery and hemorrhoids and everything else. And from that point, it wasn't just we made small holes in people, we actually changed the way we thought. And it not only became accepted, but encouraged to think creatively, to think about better ways to do things. And by the time I completed my residency, our thought process in surgery was drastically changing. And it was OK to challenge what had been done for 100 years and to ask, is that really the best way? What we have today are three speakers who, for their entire careers, have been challenging the way that we have always done things. And they're going to bring us the perspectives on what occurred historically, because it is important for us to know the history, but not to simply reside in that history. So they're going to talk about lessons that have been learned as these innovations have occurred, as they have been pioneers, as they have stood alongside other pioneers to create what we enjoy today, but also to create a mindset that lets us all contribute to creating a better tomorrow. So our first speaker is this year's program chairman, Dr. Horacio Asbin. And Dr. Asbin comes to us from Florida, up the road from me in a couple of hours. And <clears throat> Dr. Asbin has actually been involved in laparoscopic cholecystectomy since the very beginning. And he's going to talk to us about what was occurring there in the pioneering days of laparoscopic cholecystectomy and hopefully, hopefully share some insights with us about lessons we've learned about how that progressed. So, Horacio, please. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bachman. It's uh, my pleasure to be able to talk about a um, subject that it has been very dear to me and very dear to Sages and many of you in the audience. I need to make a disclaimer. I will not pretend to say that I had much to do with the first laparoscopic cholecystectomy. I am just um, a participant like many of you. And yes, I was there working with the people that created the revolution in the United States but uh, mainly a beneficiary rather than one of the innovators. Having said that, I want to echo what um, Dr. Eubank said. Thanks to that experience is that we were extremely encouraged to become innovators ourselves and working as a team. Um, first slide, please. Great. Then this saying was said in 1885 Amongst all the many advances which modern surgery has seen, I claim that there is none so certain, no so free of risk, no, nor so brilliantly successful as the surgical treatment of gallstones. I think this could have been written to about laparoscopic cholecystectomy too, even though it was several years afterwards. But who did the first laparoscopic cholecystectomy? 
Today, if you're a history buff in surgery, you probably know, but for many years, there was a lot of doubts who had been the first person that did a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And at the end, it became clear that the first person was Professor Muhe, who was born in Germany in 1938, and uh, he worked in Boblingen in 1982, and in September of 1980, did um, observe the, the laparoscopic appendectomies that are being performed by Dr. Sem, who was a gynecologist. Dr. Sem was highly recognized by doing laparoscopic, uh, laparoscopic appendectomies at that time, and he thought, maybe I can do the same thing with gallbladder. He was an avid cycler, and uh, I'll get to that a little bit more. And looking at the, at the tube of his bicycle, he thought, maybe we could do um, instrument that we can pull the gallbladder because the concept at that time was the appendix is small, can come through a small hole, but how am I going to pull the gallbladder? Then he collaborated with a gentleman called Hans Frost and created the galloscope and did his first laparoscopic cholecystectomy in 1985. This was the galloscope. If you see, the central part is, was like a tube of a bicycle. And um, he indeed um, they put a lens on the side, a working instrument, and that's how he did it. Um, this was one of his first patients. He described it as three to four incisions with pneumoperitoneum, but later on he modified the technique to do actually a single port surgery. We think that we are these brilliant guys doing single port surgery. Well, he did it. And for the next 70 or 80, he did a 2.5 centimeter incisions using the, the galloscope and basically did a single port cholecystectomy through the right upper quadrant. In 1986, after having done 94 laparoscopic cholecystectomies, we're talking April of 1986, no one had done in the world any other one, he presented to the German Surgical Society. He was completely opposed. I mean, they, the, the, his, his presentation was felt that it was dangerous. They told him in the next years, the small incisions for small brains. Um, that was the time that big surgeons, big incisions, then literally the publications in Germans said, really bashed him out, saying small incisions for small brains. They call it Mickey Mouse surgery. And a lot of the establishment in Germany went after him um, in fact, in June 1986, there was a magazine that accused him of having used his actual bicycle tubing as the galloscope. Therefore, it became now, and this was not true, of course, then it became further than just not accepting the science, but going after him personally. In March of 1987, after having done around over 100 laparoscopic cholecystectomies or so, uh, one of his patients, that went to the ICU and apparently died. Um, the, the records state that he was not secondary to the operation, that he was a very sick patient, but he died. Now, he was brought not to a malpractice suit. He was brought to criminal court for manslaughter for having done that. And it is felt that behind that suit, there was um, a lot of the establishment of the German society. That put him out of the picture um, in, in March of 1987, and he disappeared, and that's why we didn't know much about him. His other fault was that he didn't publish much in English. Um, then in 1987, a gynecologist from France did his first cholecystectomy, and he basically was thought to be the person that had done the first cholecystectomy in the world for several years because of the Muhe history. Dubois and Perissat got very um, inspired by the gynecologists, and they themselves, being surgeons, starting to do cholecystostomy and removal of stones, and then did a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And among these three gentlemen, they were the ones that really created a French revolution in laparoscopic cholecystectomy and described the French technique, that is a technique that here in the United States has not been well known, that was basically in between the legs, like the gynecologist, and the port position a little different. These are the first um, 36 cases that were published by Dubois. Um, and then in the United States, supposedly they had not heard anything about the laparoscopic cholecystectomy in Europe, and uh, 
Uh, Bill Say, who was a gynecologist in uh, uh, Atlanta with Barry McKernan, a general surgeon, did the first cholecystectomy in June of 1988. Um, they, there were a lot of stories. This was very well advertised. And uh, Bill Say and McKernan worked with Eddie Joe Reddick. Uh, they had had uh, some drinks after um, a, a congress that was done in Marietta. And they start talking, the four of them, before the cholecystectomy was done. And uh, these, the, the, the Atlanta group did it first. And then Eddie Joe Reddick and Douglas Olson did it a little later on the same year. Um, I feel that even though Reddick and Olson and Bill Say and McKernan were not the ones doing the first cholecystectomy, we really owe to Reddick, Olson, and Say the actual revolution of laparoscopic cholecystectomy in the United States. Um, the the little-known person within this group was the gynecologist in Nashville, who was a very simple guy. And he definitely was one of them that, uh, uh, that helped them start all of this and helped them develop the instruments. And he always used to tell me, I've been doing laparoscopy for so many years, he had to take the general surgeons to be the ones taking over this for the companies to listen and develop instruments. He was very facile, excellent technical surgeon, and really no one gave him much, um, much credit. Eddie Joe and um, Douglas Olson were very smart. They published this very quickly in a journal that didn't have um, much impact, but they were the ones that presented, and for many years they were felt to be the first ones doing cholecystectomy, even though they weren't. However, this was done with laser. And at the time was really good because of the fact that the energy devices were not as well developed. Um, they also had a lot of opposition. And on some areas, they were right. There was controversy because they felt that there was very much monetary profit from it. I don't agree with that. I work with them. Uh, first as a resident, I felt that this was something fantastic. And I keep calling them and calling them. And Doug Olson one day calls me and says, my secretary is tired of you giving a call. What, what do you want? I say, I want to go to do one of the weekend courses. This was 89. He says, you are a resident. Yes, why don't you come with us for a year, for a month? I said, for a month? How much is that going to be? And he says, for free. I went and rotated for a month. The first day that I'm there, there is around 28 to 30 people in the lounge before surgery. And I go, Dr. Olson, I'm, you know, Dr. Asman, I'm 28 years old. And he says, what are you doing in your suit? Go and scrub. The first day I arrived, I scrubbed in four gallbladders. And they were like that every day, doing between four and eight gallbladders. They never charged anything to the patients. But yes, they made a lot of money teaching this in doing the courses. Um, Eddie Joe told me one day, because they, there was the time that they would still do some open surgery at night, and he, I, I said, how do you keep yourself so humble? And he told me, well, because really surgery is not what I plan to do all my life. I promised my wife I was going to retire at 45. Then he first retired at 43. And what he wanted to do was to write music. And in fact, that night at 11 o'clock, he took me to his trunk, and he gave me this, this, um, this song, this vinyl that I still have of something that he has written. They were surgeons that were accused of um, not doing anything with, um, with quality. However, yes, they did weekend courses, and that may not have been ideal, and that was not the best way of starting, but they were very interested in quality. And in fact, Eddie Joe asked me to try to see how can we try to do credentialing, but there was not the academic background behind it. Then all of that created a lot of controversy, but really, they helped on the revolution. To circle back to Mue. Um, back in 1992, I was, uh, 1993, I was writing a paper, a review of laparoscopic cholecystectomies. I was by then a fellow in HPB at Lehi Clinic. And, um, and then subsequently, I went to Bolivia. And I received, uh, I'm looking for the papers at that time. We didn't have internet, of course, or anything like that. And I'm looking for the papers. And I reviewed this paper that somebody had sent me uh, two years later, a year later telling me that, you know, I'm saying, well, I don't know, I, haven't even, I hadn't even put attention to this paper, and it says long-term follow-up. Long-term follow-up, and this was a paper in 1992. How could it be long-term follow-up? And I start reading it, and the guy says that he had done from 1985 to 1987, 94 patients. I couldn't believe it. At the time, I was in Bolivia, 
And I had a German person that was a patient of mine in Bolivia to try to find this surgeon in Boblingen and show me proof that indeed he had done this and he had published. And he sent me this. Unfortunately, this is a fax from that time. And that is his original publication in the 1986 uh, meeting where he was bashed by, by having done this. Then later on, though, he was re-vindicated. The German Surgical Society gave him the anniversary award in April of 1992, which was the best, the, the highest award given to a surgeon in Germany. And interestingly enough, they wrote one of the greatest original achievements of German medicine in recent history. Four years earlier, he was in criminal court for manslaughter. At Sages, he was also recognized and given the annual Carl Storr Lecture in March of 1999. Since then, he has passed, but I think he was ahead of his time. He's an innovator, and we really owe a lot to him. Thank you very much.